Hi, ladies and gentlemen, this is Ms. Skoken. We're continuing our work in Chapter 8, Confidence Intervals, and today we're going to learn about what the confidence level means. We're going to be using an applet. The link can be found on Canvas, or if you need to type it in directly, I've written it in for you. Now, what we're going to be doing is using the applet. First of all, the proportion, the population proportion, is going to be preset when you get there to 0.5 you're gonna make sure that the confidence level shows 95% and the sample size you're gonna slide over to 75. Next, you're gonna click on the sample button. That's gonna create the interval using the point estimate and a margin of error, just like we learned about in the last lesson. On the applet, you can also see all of the different values, uh, the 75 different values as little dots below the confidence interval. True population proportion, remember, was preset to 0.5, and that's represented by the vertical green line in the center of the graph. Draw in the first sample that you got. As you can see, I've drawn mine in, and the first sample that I got definitely intersects with that green vertical line, which means the interval does capture the true population proportion. Yours may or may not, but draw it in. Next, you're gonna click the sample button nine more times so that you have a total of 10 samples. Each one of those samples is gonna be the center or the point estimate for a confidence interval. So we're gonna end up with a total of 10 confidence intervals. So you're gonna pause the video, collect your nine additional samples, draw them in, and then turn the video back on so we can continue. We know that sampling variability exists. So we know that every single time we get a sample, we get what we get. And when we build the interval around it, we're each going to have a different combination of 10 samples and 10 intervals. Out of the 10 samples that I collected, nine of them captured or included the true population proportion, which is represented by that green vertical line at 0 0.50. The next instruction is to reset. That's the red button on your applet. And then take a total of 100 confidence intervals. You can do that by taking a sample of 25 four times. Once you do that, you're gonna count how many, or it actually tells you, out of the 100 total samples that you took, how many hit the actual population proportion, or once again, that green vertical line. And on mine, I got 98%. Once again, just like we have sampling variability, when we sample 100, we're still going to have some variability. So you may have higher, you may have lower, but just write down what you got under number three. And then, is this surprising or is it not? And with a confidence level of 95%, capturing the true population proportion 98 times out of 100 samples is not surprising. Next on the applet, see what happens to the confidence interval as you drag the slider from 95% confident to 99% confident. What happens to the interval and why does this make sense? First of all, the interval gets wider as the confidence level increases. And regardless of what your capture rate was on number three, when you increase the width of the confidence interval, it's gonna capture more values and that means you have a greater likelihood of including or capturing the population proportion. So regard again, when, no matter what number you got under number three, your capture rate is gonna be larger when you have a confidence level of 99 instead of 95. Now you may have noticed that the point estimate doesn't change. So when you think about the confidence interval, which is made up of the point estimate and the margin of error, as the confidence level gets larger, Point estimate stays the same, but the margin of error changes, and that's what makes the confidence interval wider. Time to reset again. This time you're gonna take the slider for confidence level all the way down to 80%. That's all the way on the left-hand side. And then you're going to, again, sample 25 four times so that you end up with 100. What percent of the intervals capture the true proportion or that green vertical line this time? Each one of us is going to have a different value, of course, but my hit rate for capturing the true population pr proportion was 77%.
which is close to 80%, and that's not a coincidence. So let's try to put down something that generalizes the confidence level. We took 100 samples at a confidence level of 95 and then raised the confidence level to 99, and then we took another 100 samples after we reset at a confidence level of 80. What do we observe, and how can we interpret that confidence level? If we take many samples and make many confidence intervals using p hat as the point estimate, we expect about 80% of the confidence intervals will capture the true proportion, which, remember, is represented by that green line at 0 0.50. Now let's try holding the confidence level steady but changing the sample size. We're going to start out with a sample size of 20 and take one sample. Notice the width of the confidence interval. Now we're going to change the sample size to 250 and take one sample. What happened to the width of the interval when the sample size increased? And why do you think that might have happened? When the sample size is large, the interval narrows. And you might remember the relationship between the standard deviation of a sampling distribution versus the standard deviation of the population that the sampling distribution came from. When the sample size goes up, the variability or the standard deviation goes down, it gets smaller. And that's what we see happening here. The margin of error decreases because it's based on the standard deviation. Our first learning target was to interpret a confidence level in context. And the confidence level is the approximate number of intervals that we expect are, is, are going to capture the true population value if we take many, many samples around which we build confidence intervals. Our next learning target is describe how the sample size and confidence level affect the margin of error. And we learned from the applet that when we had a larger confidence level, we saw the interval get wider, the margin of error increased. We also learned that when we increase the sample size, the margin of error decreased, making the interval narrower. And the third learning target is explain how practical issues like non-response, undercoverage, and response bias, all of which we learned about when we studied chapter four, can affect the interpretation of a confidence interval. And this is something that we need to remember. Even though it's called margin of error, it doesn't really have anything to do with error or doing something wrong. When we have data collection and there is something that is not well designed, it introduces bias. Margin of error has nothing to do with bias. It's only related to the width of the confidence interval, and that is based on the confidence level. So we'll get more into the mechanics of choosing the confidence level and the resulting width of the confidence interval in a future lesson. But for right now, just recognize that the margin of error doesn't have anything to do with bias or with error. At this point in the lesson, you're ready to practice your new vocabulary and your new skills on the check your understanding questions. Work on these before you check the answers against the posted answers. And I will see you back in class.